Well, thank you for doing this, Greg. Well, uh, and you. Um, my effort will simply be to uh, lead you through your career and uh, uh, allow you to tell its story. So let's let's begin back with with you as you head off to law school, um, mm. if you will, mm. uh, ancient history, of course. But um, mm. when you went to law school, um, had that been a long-term plan? No. Was law as a career or something? That... No, no, not at all. Uh, there were no lawyers in my family. Indeed, nobody in my family had gone to college. Um, and my plan was to get a PhD in English, and I was all set to do that. Um, I was going to go to the University of Chicago. Um, and then uh, in my senior year, in the spring of my senior year, I was uh, seriously dating um, this uh, young co-ed named Kim Krugel, and uh, she is a, a very practical person and said, you know, uh, the prospects for getting teaching jobs, PhDs in English, are not very good. Why don't you think about law school? Uh, your brother-in-law, who you admire, uh, is a lawyer and seems to enjoy it. Um, and uh, you have an interest in social justice issues and a law degree would be, uh, would better serve you than an English PhD. So in April of my senior year, <laughs> I took the LSAT and I applied just to Northwestern. I was um, uh, a senior at the University of Illinois and Kim was going to uh, teach at um, uh, gosh, where was it? Um, one of the suburban schools. Mm -hmm. So we had to be uh, on the north side. Uh, we were going to get engaged. And um, lo and behold, they admitted me, and the rest is history. Now, your generation, like mine, um, made educational and career decisions somewhat affected. The males did, at least by the military draft. Was that hovering over your head at that time? Not at that time. I had just gotten off the hook. I was in the first class to be selected on the basis of the lottery. Remember that? I remember that the, because the, I was of a prior generation. Of a prior, yeah. yeah. So... Um, the, the, the basis for selecting who was going to get pulled out of the entire 1A group uh, was changed to the lottery system. And the first lottery selection was actually televised nationally. Uh, that was my senior year, spring of my senior year in college. Um, I fully expected to be drafted, and so I had an application in for Navy OCS because I did not want to be a grunt uh, in the Army. Um, and they uh, said they were going to start um, with number one and expected to get maybe up to number 200. Anybody over 200, no chance they were going to be drafted. I pulled number 348. <laughs> a very good number indeed. A very good number. And, and uh, the next day I went down and withdrew my application for Navy OCS. All right. Bo so, both of my brothers uh, served in the Army. Right. So, so you, you, you went to law school for practical reasons, so or at least yeah. with, the, with the insight, Kim's insight, that this uh, had better career prospects yeah. Yeah. Um, than, than a PhD in English. Right. Uh, you clerked for a law firm in your summer. You uh, clerked for a judge upon I graduation. I did, yeah. And then you went after a PhD in philosophy. Yes, I did. I combined, I was a Bigelow Fellow at Chicago, um, which I found was not very time consuming at all. Um, and I had um, uh, still thoughts of um, getting a 
PhD. Um, I had been a double major in college, uh, English and philosophy, and was, uh, I had a growing interest in philosophy, and so I applied and was admitted to uh, the PhD program in philosophy at Chicago, um, and I started um, the program and, dur during the Bigelow. And would you explain for those who don't know Bigelow, what, what, what Bigelow oh, is? Oh, Bigelow is really just a teaching fellow. So you were you were teaching first year teaching law students first yeah um, basically uh, legal writing mm -hmm. um, although uh, I also co-taught conflict of laws with uh, a long since retired member of the Chicago faculty very distinguished member of the Chicago faculty named Max Reinstein um, Max was. Uh, a, uh, uh, a German Jew emigre um, uh, who had escaped the Nazis uh, come to, he was part of this generation of uh, German Jews uh, who had escaped the Nazis, come to the United States uh, like Rudy Schlesinger. Like Rudy Schlesinger. And uh, gotten an American law degree and maybe practiced a while and then gone into academic life. Uh, enormously educated uh, and um, Max uh, was uh, very very elderly and they dra dragooned him into teaching conflicts because nobody else was willing to teach it. Uh, Max was really hard of hearing so they asked me to come in and co-teach it with him so that I could tell him what the students were saying. That's a challenging role. It was a very challenging role, but it was really rewarding because I developed this um, sort of father-son relationship with, with, Max. with Max. Yeah. And was it sort of in that classroom that the idea of being a law teacher, um, a professional uh, academic in law? Well, the seed had been planted earlier. Um, uh, that was part of the reason for uh, doubling up the Bigelow and uh, the PhD. Uh, and I was um, increasingly thinking of law teaching um, because I saw what was uh, going on in law teaching at Chicago itself. Chicago is an enormously um, uh, intellectually vibrant uh, uh, law school. Um, I found it a very exciting place. Um, I didn't like uh, the law and economics, but I really liked um, the intellectual uh, verve uh, of the place. And, and of course, your different role allowed you to taste of that in a way that being a student at Northwestern didn't. That's exactly right. Exactly right. So uh, following this year in which you were a Bigelow and also a PhD, beginning in a PhD in philosophy, you went on the job market. Yeah, I had had a mentor uh, at Northwestern uh, named uh, John Waltz, um, who had helped me get the, the clerkship on the Sixth Circuit. And uh, I stayed in touch with him. and. He suggested that I test the waters for getting a tenure track teaching job in law um, coming straight off the Bigelow. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did that, entering my name in the AALS um, uh, teaching market. And much to my surprise, uh, I had a number of inquiries and a number of interviews. Um, and that was in an era when the recruitment conference coincided with the annual meeting. Right. Uh, where did you where did you have to travel to get these these interviews, or or did you bypass the recruitment conference? No, I went to the recruitment conference. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and had several interviews there, um, and then several on campus interviews. Right. Um, my wife and I, Kim and I, had decided that 
uh, we wanted uh, to locate in the South. Uh, the Sixth Circuit includes Kentucky and Tennessee. It's Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Um, and during that time, we went down to Nashville to visit some friends and liked it there and, mm -hmm. and thought, you know, we had spent all of our lives in um, Illinois. And if we were ever going to escape uh, to a different part of the country, to see a different part of the country, mm -hmm. this would be the time. So we thought, well, why not live in the South for a while? Um, so I interviewed and had offers from uh, several Southern law schools, and I really liked the University of Georgia. It was hiring several young people, it was interesting young people, the school was ambitious. Um, Athens was a great town. Um, we had planned to... Uh, it's, it's a university town. It's a university town. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, close to Atlanta. Um, so uh, I took that offer. Now, Greg Alexander and property uh, have to be uttered in the same breath. Uh, yes. Now, that, now that when you entered happen. teaching, was that the case? Yeah. I mean, I confess that when I entered teaching, I became a property teacher because that's what Minnesota needed. And if I'd gone to Virginia, as I had an offer to do, I would have been a contract teacher. Yeah. Is that? No, uh, that did not happen right away. Yeah. I started as a contracts person. Contracts and conflict of laws. Um, and I was awful. My first year was bloody. Uh, the teaching evaluations were scathing. Um, I tried to be a person who I was not. Um, did you draw upon some model at yes, Northwestern? Or? Yes, yeah, that's yeah, exactly yeah, what I did. Yeah. And it just fell completely flat. Um, uh, I was so bad that I seriously thought of getting out of law teaching. And in fact, I interviewed with law firms back in Chicago. Um, uh, but I taught summer school. Georgia had a summer school. Um, and uh, I, I thought, well, it's summer school. You know, I'm not sure I'm going to continue doing this. So. I'm just going to be myself. Uh, mm -hmm. Nothing's writing on this anymore. So, mm -hmm. you know, what the hell? So I just relaxed. Um, I let my shoulders down and I was myself. I uh, told some jokes. And, uh, it was a lot more casual. And the teaching evaluations just soared. And I enjoyed it. <laughs> uh, I taught the same way the next year, and the teaching evaluations were a lot better. And then I got a visiting offer from the University of Virginia um, and went up there um, hoping to get a permanent offer, which I did not. So I came that. I. I was trying to write articles at that point in conflicts, and I published some articles um, in some pretty good places, um, but I, I, intellectually, I felt that I was just hitting a, a dry well. Mm -hmm. So I came back to Georgia and decided I need to retool. So I, the, uh, Georgia had this uh, wonderful uh, property and trust and estates man who had come to Georgia, moved to Georgia from the University of Michigan. Um, I mentioned that Georgia was a very ambitious school at that point. And they hired him from Michigan with a, a, a chair. Um, and he already had a very large reputation in property and trust and estates, Dick Wellman. Um, and I talked to Dick, and Dick said, well, why don't you try teaching property and trust and estates? Did, did you take the, you took property, but did you take trust and estates 
in law school. I said, <clears throat> yeah, I did. And uh, I did well, uh, both in trust in the states one and two, and really enjoyed uh, both of those courses. So I, I took those courses, learning those courses basically at his knee. He was my, he really mm -hmm. taught me those courses and became my mentor. Um, uh, he was a, a, a warm, kind, um, wonderful teacher. And um, set me off yeah. in a career. That was an era when ambitious state schools uh, were <clears throat> playing that sort of game, finding uh, a national figure in a field and trying to woo them with a chair or uh, and 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 with a, a salary that was well beyond the local scale. That's right, and that's exactly what happened with him. Yeah. Uh, Bill Hogan spent a year at the University of Minnesota on exactly that kind of arrangement. Mm. Um, so that's how you and property got together yes. and trusts and estates. Yes. Exactly. And it was a good match because your career has had um, a, a continuity and a coherence that many of our colleagues' careers have not. I mean, we, we have colleagues who rather jump around in the curriculum and... Um, it it yeah. has. It yeah. was a, yeah. it was a very good marriage, and I was fortunate that it came pretty early in mm -hmm. my career. Mm -hmm. um, and I was also fortunate that uh, I found a, a scholarly voice mm -hmm. at a mm -hmm. pretty early stage. Uh, so let's let's follow you on your path to Ithaca. Uh, and then let's return to that voice. Um, you, um, you taught as a visitor at Virginia, you taught in Michi at Michigan, you taught at UCLA before, right. before you ended up here at Cornell as a visitor in 84. That's right. Um, what, uh, I mean, having tasted of this other law schools, what, uh, what caused you to, in the end, say, all right, this is the right place? A uh, combination of factors, um, not the least of which was the location. Um, what was appealing about Virginia and also Michigan um, were that they were uh, university towns. We had two small children at that stage, and these were ideal places to raise small children. Um, unlike those places, and certainly unlike Athens, Georgia, uh, the public schools here were excellent. Uh, and that was really important to us. Uh, the public schools in Charlottesville and Athens, certainly, and to some extent even in Ann Arbor, uh, not so good. Um, uh, most of the people in Athens sent their kids to a uh, private academy. Uh, we were really quite opposed to that. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we learned about the strength of the public school system here, that was a big, big plus. Um, and we really liked um, the the um, the ethos of collegiality at Cornell, which we didn't experience at um, any of the other schools. Uh, UCLA was a large urban school. Um, Virginia had a large faculty, um, although it's in a small town. There wasn't a great deal of coherence there. Mm -hmm. um, Michigan had more of it than the other two, um, but not to the same degree as, 
as here. There was a special sense of collegiality, respect, um, and um, uh, um, how do I put it? Um, community mm -hmm. that I found here that uh, just wasn't present at the other schools. Um, and I, I didn't, I certainly didn't see it even at Georgia. Um, and of course, the reputa reputation of, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of the law school and the university. Mm -hmm. Having found that you could be teaching as yourself, yeah. you, you were able to do it here. Uh, and um, the other evening we were talking about um, the bits of business that uh, sometimes property teachers draw upon to um, illustrate a conceptual point. Um, were there uh, things that your students would find memorable? about Greg Alexander as a property teacher or a trust in the state's teacher, uh, as you think on this, the, the you of the classroom, the, the, the things that you drew upon to make. Well, um, a lot of my students uh, remember my jokes. All right. Um, for better or worse, I've used humor in the classroom. Um, some of it planned, a lot of it just spontaneous. spontaneous yeah. yeah, it just um, uh, is humor that will come out of itself. Um, and uh, students remember that. Um, I also use contemporary music. Um, I sing uh, in in the classroom, uh, I have songs, uh, the lyrics to which I've adapted to uh, to make a, a property point, to make or a property or trust in the state's, state's point. point. Yeah, um, I'll make allusions to uh, currently popular bands. Just the other evening, I went to the Cornell um, uh, Christmas um, uh, concert at Sage, Sage Hall. Yeah. And uh, who should come in and sit right in front of me but Tracy Metrano, um, who, as you know, mm -hmm. ran for Congress mm -hmm. recently, unsuccessfully, alas. But she was really surprised to see me after so many years. And what did she remember? My reference to the band Nine Inch Nails. <laughs> you know, Sort of thing that I now you're you you've not just <clears throat> been a consistent teacher of these subjects you've done teaching material you've done course books in both property and I have and both 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 property uh, and courses, trust yeah. and estates um, wh how did that come about I mean you you were using course books and adapting course books and then drawn into being a co-author of them right that's yeah. exactly yeah. how it came about. Uh, with uh, the Trust in the States casebook came first. Um, I was using um, the book that was originally Dick Wellman's casebook, my mm -hmm. sort of mentor, mentor at Georgia. Uh, he then brought aboard um, the teacher who uh, I had had at Northwestern, who had then s since gone on to Michigan Larry Wagoner, and Larry then eventually brought me aboard. So Larry and I and Dick uh, were co-editors, co-authors mm -hmm. of that book. Um, and then we subsequently added other co-authors. Mm -hmm. uh, so we worked on that book for many years. I no longer work in that book. Mm -hmm. uh, the property book came about uh, as I had taught uh, Duke Manier and Creer for a number of years, it was by far the leading property book 
sorry, Peter, um, for a long time, really, mm -hmm. ever since it mm -hmm. uh, came out. Uh, Jim Creer um, had started at UCLA, uh, moved to Stanford, didn't like Stanford, and came back to UCLA. That's when I met him. When, I, when you were uh, visiting When I was visiting at UCLA. And Jim and I, for some reason, uh, really struck up a friendship. And uh, we became fast friends, and we still are very close friends. Um, our wives are close friends. Um, it's, a, it's a very special friendship we have. Um, when Jesse Duke Muneer died, uh, Jim needed to find somebody to take his place. Uh, the two of them, Jim and Jesse, had particular roles that they played. Jim provided the law and economics uh, perspective. Jesse provided the um, uh, historical and uh, future interests mm -hmm. uh, perspective. So Jim thought I'd be the ideal person because uh, some of my scholarship was historical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Jim invited me to take Jesse's place. And I'm, I still work on still that. Still work on that book, yeah. Which leads me to ask, uh, and, and this is sort of getting ahead of myself a bit, but will you continue to work on such a book after you retire? Uh, will you continue to write? Uh, yeah, yes. The short answer is yes and yes. Uh, I will continue to work on uh, the property book. I don't know how many more editions. Uh, and Jim is still working on it. And Jim is 10 mm -hmm. years older than I am. Mm -hmm. um, I love working on that book. Mm -hmm. uh, we have two editions. One is the original, the main, that book. And the other is a concise edition that I do myself. Uh, and I really like working the concise edition. Um, so I'll do that for the foreseeable mm -hmm. future. Uh, and I'll still continue to do my own scholarship. I have projects or projects un still underway. Yeah. Yeah. So let's turn to those projects, projects that have also in enjoyed, I, I believe, synergy with your teaching. That is to say, you, when you came to Cornell very quickly, you introduced uh, a seminar on uh, theories of property. I did. Um, and it was interdisciplinary yeah. and... Um, shall I say, tailored, at least as I perceived it, to your current projects. It was. Yeah. That's uh, right. And then when you got interested in uh, constitutional dimensions of property, uh, you did a seminar. So um, could you talk about the relationship, but how, you, how you used seminars in relation to your scholarly project of the moment? Um, good question. Um, I, I've long thought that seminars are the vehicle for, are, are the door for students to see and be involved in, to come into the world of, uh, the faculty's scholarship, um, that there shouldn't be a complete separation between mm -hmm. what the students see and do and what the faculty does. Um, there should be some integration, and the seminar is uh, the locus for that integration. Um, and so that's what I've tried to do. Um, all of my work since coming here certainly has been theoretical in nature. Mm, I would, a, a good 90% of it. Mm -hmm. um, and it has variations on it. Um, and so the seminar has changed over time. Mm -hmm. um, what I, the materials that I teach from year to year shift as my scholarly 
uh, interest has shifted, um, what I'm reading currently, I have the students read, um, what I'm thinking about, I lay out before the students to get their input. I have the students write sh very short, one to two page weekly papers responding to the readings. Um, and this is an occasion for me to get some outside thoughts as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, Do you have them write longer works? And too? then I have them write at the end a longer paper, about a 25 page paper. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and I find and it works. This, it really works. The students really appreciate. Now, some of our colleagues aren't able really to excite students uh, in the zone in which they are working. In other words, so that not only is this important to you, but you somehow have a recipe that has drawn students in um, to this mutual project, in a sense. Yeah, I suppose so. I don't, yeah. I don't know what the secret sauce is, but um, uh, the seminar has been exciting every year that I've taught it. Um, the students come from a wide variety of backgrounds, so it's not as though uh, there's a, uh, a, 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 a commonality to the profile mm -hmm. uh, of the students each year. Um, I have a smattering of students uh, with a background in philosophy, but that's never more than a small number of students. Mm -hmm. Most of them don't have mm -hmm. uh, any prior training in philosophy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I tell them I don't require that. Um, uh, just that there be an interest in the theoretical dimension of property. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've always had some students coming from other departments in the university, ranging from history to government to ILR to urban and regional planning. So the student body has been leavened by this interdisciplinary element. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And the readings are very interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. I don't have them reading just law review mm -hmm. articles. Um, we do a fair amount of economics. Uh, we read a fair amount of, certainly a fair amount of philosophy, um, some history, some anthropology. And there is, to the, to your friend, uh, a continuity between this and the uh, philosophy graduate student, right? I mean, so that, that that's a that's a that's a strand that has continued through that, your scholarly career. Yes, that is definitely a strand that yeah, has continued. Yeah. Uh, this work that you've done, uh, the scholarly work, um, unlike some things that other property scholars do, has generated a lot of interest outside the United States and has led to uh, exciting exchanges with scholars elsewhere and opportunities to um, work with colleagues outside the United States. So could we follow you on that agenda or travel, all right? So you've, you've, you've spent time uh, in Germany. You've spent time uh, at the Center for Advanced Study of Behavioral Sciences at Palo Alto. Uh, an interdisciplinary environment, and done other speaking and exchanges abroad. So could you talk a bit about that and how that has unfolded and, and what that's led to? Sure. Um, uh, yeah, I've been really fortunate about um, those opportunities. Um, not sure what the first one was. Um, uh, certainly the first sustained one was in Germany. Um, I had an appointment at uh, two Max Planck Institutes. Mm -hmm. The first one was uh, the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg, which focuses on um, public comparative law. 
Um, and the second uh, focuses on private comparative law, and that's in Hamburg. So I spent um, uh, three months in each. And, and your work at the time was on the constitutional dimension? Uh, it, it was on the dimension of private. That's right. Yeah. Uh, the German uh, uh, equivalent of the takings clause, uh, the German um, constitutional property clause. Uh, there was a particular aspect of that that really interested me that we don't have in our constitution. And I wanted to see what, if any, practical effect it has. Um, and that led to uh, an article that I published in the Cornell Law Review um, that has gotten a fair amount of attention, both in this country and abroad. Um, and I've since gone back to Germany. I've gone to the Humboldt uh, University in Berlin. Um, and then the other uh, sustained uh, experience I've had has been in South Africa. Um, Which again, uh, fueled or uh, provided material for your constitutional property work. Exactly. Yeah. That, that also yeah. was um, comparative constitutional property. Um, that uh, The first project there was uh, under the auspices of a fellowship at uh, the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, in Stellenbosch, which is mm, maybe 50 kilometers north of Cape Town. Cape Town. Um, that was a great experience because it first put me in touch with um, the um, a late Andre van der Velt, uh, who since became a, uh, a, a very deep, close friend of mine. Uh, whose death I, I still mourn. Um, Andre was a member of the law faculty at uh, Stellenbosch University um, and a, a major figure in uh, the legal academy in, in South Africa. Um, and I learned a, an enormous amount from him. Uh, and that led to um, scholarship. Um, and then I went to Palo Alto and put all this together in a book uh, that I published uh, at the University of Chicago Press. And, and I've what... since gone back to South Africa to teach. Mm -hmm. um, and and you've your work has caught interest around the world. I mean, you I I, I know that you've been invited to give talks hither, thither, and yon. Um, and, and perhaps that will generate further work, I don't know. But uh, it, it, in other words, is that many think of property as a very um, parochial or, or very local field. Uh, and of course, it's rich in detail that may vary dramatically even from state to state within the US. But uh, your work has been at, at a level that has allowed exchange with scholars who come at it from a very different legal environment. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that because, uh, as you know, for the past um, four years, I've been living part-time in Healdsburg, mm -hmm. California, um, where none of my friends are academics. And when they find out that I'm going off somewhere to give a talk in Buenos Aires or um, Mexico City, uh, they say, well, they don't have American property law, so how, how can you talk to them about it? And I say, well, I'm talking to them about comparative constitutional property. And they scratch their heads a little bit and they're like, well, what, what's that about? Right. And I, I, no, no concept that that there is a constitutional dimension to yeah, property. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah and yeah. you know, I explain a little bit in a few sentences, mm -hmm. and a light bulb goes on, mm -hmm. and they suddenly see the global aspect of, mm -hmm. of what property can be about, mm -hmm. and what the absence of a property <laughs> regime can regime be about. can be about exactly. Right, right. 
Uh, was it that time in Palo Alto when um, you put down roots in California? Oh, bad timing. Yeah. Because, wow. I mean, upon retirement, you're going to head for Healdsburg, and that will be your center of gravity. That right? will be. I hope we'll see you back in Ithaca. But... I, well, I surely hope so. Yeah. Uh, but, but, yeah, that will be home. Uh, it's home now. Mm -hmm. um, Let's see, that was 94, um, and uh, we bought the place in 99. Um, I don't know, you'd really have to ask my wife, because the decision to move to Healdsburg was all Kim's idea. She planted the flag there in she, Healdsburg. She, uh, this is all, all her doing. Uh, the way this came about was, um, she had followed me around with all these moves that we've uh, rehearsed. She followed me around uh, at the expense of really developing her own career. Um, she's an enormously intelligent and talented person, so this was a real sacrifice for her. Uh, and I said, look, uh, when it's time to decide where we're going to retire, uh, you get to choose. And she said, you know, when we first saw the Bay Area back in 1971, I knew that this is where I wanted to retire. So our daughter graduated from Stanford in 1999, and we went up to uh, Sonoma County take our daughter up there for the weekend, and it was love at first sight. Um, Sonoma County looks like um, the south of France, and Kim just fell in love with it and said, why don't we buy right now before uh, the prices just get completely out of our range? And I thought she was crazy, but uh, crazy like a fox. She had the right idea. Mm -hmm. um, so we bought a place that was not very good. We knew that we'd have to tear it down eventually, uh, but we got our foot in the water. Or, uh, and um, that was it. Now, I happen to know that one of the one of the things you do there is uh, you paint watercolors. I do. I do. Uh, yes. Is that a Healdsburg activity only, or or have you been doing that secretly all along? Uh, I took classes here as well uh, for some years. Um, dabbled off and on here, but never in a sustained way here. When I got out there. I found an art teacher uh, who was a truly gifted teacher. And I took classes, I still do, every Friday, all, all Friday morning. Um, and it became a passion. So um, that is... Um, an activity that is has become very sustaining to me. So you'll be balancing painting and scholarship writing. Yes. Yeah. Among other activities. Among other activities. Yeah. Yeah. We've come to the point where I, I'm going to ask you or if, if there are things that we haven't talked about that you'd like to talk about. Well, I thought you might ask me about how the school has changed. I would be delighted to have you reflect on that. Um, when I first came here in 84, um, fortunate uh, that you hired me, um, I sense that the school was still in a transition period, transitioning out of being a very strong, but still somewhat regional school into a truly national school. Um, and now it's 
clearly um, a national school, um, not, a, a, not at all a, a regional school. Mm -hmm. The school now is not what it was when I came here. The people who we hire now, we wouldn't have been able to, they, the, the people wouldn't have considered coming here. Well, you joined the faculty along with a cohort of some very, very strong people. Yes. Um, so that it was... And, and I could tell that uh, the people who were coming when I came were part of this shift. Um, it was a, a time of the schools clearly being on an upward sloping curve. And that was a big part of my excitement to join mm -hmm. the Cornell faculty. And to be the be a part of making Being, it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, it's a far more truly interdisciplinary school uh, now than it was then. Uh, then we like to think of ourselves as interdisciplinary, but we weren't then nearly so much as we are now. Well, interdisciplinary then meant having uh, people who had been, who were scholars in another discipline who were interested in law. Right. So David Lyons in philosophy was also teaching in the law school. That's right. Uh, George Hay with a PhD in economics. Right and also a member of the economics department, was right. in the law school. Right. Um, now we have people coming with advanced degrees in other subjects. Exactly. And also a law degree in teaching right. in the law school. Right. Uh, I wouldn't get hired today. <laughs> Without that PhD. <laughs> yeah. I mean, with, yeah. with the background that uh, I had when you hired me, the school wouldn't take a second look at me. And that's as it should be. Well, but that would be regrettable. Eh? Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, I have at least one more question. Sure. Um, and I, uh, I'll, I'll begin by talking about my late colleague, Kurt Henslow. I don't think you overlapped. No, we did not All right. overlap. Regrettable. Well, at, at a time when uh, this was really quite rare. Kurt Hanslow, reflecting his l labor background, never wore a tie, always wore a t-shirt. Sometimes it was a quite formal black t-shirt, all right? He stood out. Greg Alexander has stood out at the other end of the spectrum. He yeah. set a standard in attire for the faculty, the yeah. male faculty, <laughs> that, uh, that I don't think anyone really gets much close to, except perhaps it's our, our dean, as he goes forth to be dean somewhere. <laughs> Has that uh, been a regular part of your persona? Not always. Yeah. You may remember there was a time, oh, it may have lasted two years, maybe, maybe only a year, when I did not wear a tie. And I had a beard. Mm -hmm. Um. I shifted. I, I wore a tie when I first came here. And then I got rid of the tie and just wore sweaters. Um, but I decided uh, to put ties back on and to start wearing bow ties and to really start looking nice for two reasons. One, I thought you know, I'm a model to students of what a professional is um, and what they should expect when they get out of here. Um, I'm not one of them. Mm -hmm. And I shouldn't look like a student. The second reason was um, the standard for my colleague's attire was really sliding. Absolutely. And I thought, I'm going to buck the trend. And I was just being contrarian. And I thought, 
Well, if the rest of you are going to be slobs, I'm going to go the other way and show the students how it should be done. <laughs> so, <laughs> you see the result. Right. Other topics uh, that we should uh, visit? I Have the students changed in the period that you've reflected on changes in the uh, stature of the school and the, the, um, the outlook of the faculty? Well, uh, the faculty has changed in ways mm -hmm. uh, we've already um, referenced. Um, it's more interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, um, students are bringing some more experiences into the students, class. Students are bringing more experience. Um, one thing that I, I find still a constant that I've always really appreciated about Cornell students is that they're always prepared. Um, it, it's the rare Cornell student um, who, when I've called on him or her, is not prepared. I cold call on students. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's very common, but uh, I do it, um, and I announce that on the first day. Um, and it, it just... It, so rare for and you do that in your trust in the state and upper, i do that in yeah, in yeah, uh, yeah. an upper level yeah trust in yeah, the state's yeah. class too mm -hmm. uh and it's so rare for me to call in a student and have the student be unprepared mm -hmm. uh gosh that's really unusual among and law it, schools it, these it, days. it makes such a huge difference in in teaching oh yeah oh gosh yeah all the difference in the world I, I taught uh, my very last Trust in Estates class ever, just a few days ago. And it, uh, that class was just such a delight to teach. It was, it was just a barrel of fun. And, you, and you'll miss it. I will miss that. Yeah. Yes, I will miss that. It's not going to be the very last class ever that I will teach because I'm already scheduled to teach uh, an entirely different course uh, in Tel Aviv a year from this spring. All right. So you're not saying goodbye to, the, to teaching? I'm not saying goodbye to teaching. Yeah. No. All right. Well, that's good. Good for your students. Yeah. Good for you. It is. Yeah. And thank you again. Thank you. All right. I appreciate it very All much. Right.